Welcome to episode 9, Collared Lizard Care. Today I'm going to go over my detailed care sheet that I offered all my clients discussing enclosure, temperature and lighting, and food for everything you need to know to properly care for your collared lizard. Here is a picture of my detailed care sheet, which I will have available through a link in the bio. Hey guys, so today I'm going to show you Collar Lizard Care 101. Basically, you can go over everything you need to know from enclosures, temperatures, and lighting, and food to properly care for your collared lizard. Now, generally, I like to say that every enclosure should be around at least 75 gallons or equivalent. So this gives enough space for adequate moving around for a very active species like a collared lizard. As you can see here, I have a 200 and 75 gallon tank and I actually have it partitioned into three sections so you can see here with the 275 gallon tank it's around 90 gallons plus or minus depending on how much the partitions are actually equal to where they actually have adequate space around six square feet on the bottom total for each section which is good space to run around, move, and I actually can adjust heights to wherever I have UVB lighting. But this again, I have a typical breeding setup where you can see the tile, some brick outline, a little basking area, and a water dish. Now all of these are now empty because the lizards I have in them are in brumation. And then I have over here another little hide rock where they can perch out on water dish and other areas for them to climb around and hide and again here different setup i don't have the light set up here because i was going to show you guys the different lights i have but again a cave nice basking area little water dish down there and just more enrichment for them sand around everywhere if they can dig also hunt for prey other things like that so this is three typically different setups i have again a breeding setup a normal setup with a cave and another normal setup with a cave. Now again, I'm sorry these aren't 100% cleaned out. I normally clean them out once I get ready to put them back in. After brumation, I'm going through all the tanks, getting some ready for brumation and taking care of the little babies as they start to grow. And I'll show you shortly some other things that I like to keep constant, like different water sources of drippers or just pouring water in, keeping water in the tank is very key and also letting them know that that is a source to drink. I also sometimes will syringe water to them if I think they're not drinking enough because hydration is very key to proper health. And as you guys can see, nice adequate space here allows for a happy and comfortable collar lizard. Now here's a bag of play sand, so you can see it's play sand, but one of the key important things, you wanna make sure that it's actually washed play sand. So one of the things I've found out over the years is that washed play sand has a lot of removed sharp silicates, which can cause a lot of GI irritation or with improper hydration, lighting, and other things, then cause impaction. But again, with key hydration, key temperatures, key lighting, you shouldn't have an issue and again washed play sand i can't harp on this enough is the perfect more ideal substrate to allow for the lizards to have good enrichment to be able to dig and have a happy digging environment and other things like that and also a safe environment to where say they do eat a cricket superworm dubia roach anything they go for if they do eat some of the sand, it doesn't affect them and they can just pass it normally without any of the sharp silicates in the substrate it just runs through the GI tract nice and easy. Now the next part I want to make sure and harp on is proper temperature control. As you can see, this is just a basic, you know, wall attachment zoom med thermometer. And you can tell that it's roughly around 105. This is actually right above one of the basking areas I have. So that tells me that it is in the right range that I'm wanting. Literally the light is two inches off from the wall down there and another two inches down to where it hits. And you can see 105 here. I do have a laser gun that helps me actually give an accurate temperature. And I'll show you some other key tips and other things you can use 
to get a good temperature range and another good way to really know that the temperature is in the right area to where I like also having digital readers for one in the basking area or around the area so I know the peak temperatures are getting to where I want to be as well as also having some of the more cooler temperatures and ambient temperatures being in the proper range as well. Again, I like saying rule of thumb 105 to 115 basking temperature. It can get hotter, but a lot of times they will retreat from that and go into the cave to where you want them to be out basking, soaking in some of the proper UVB lighting as well. In addition to ambient temperatures, never getting really below 75. I like keeping it around the 80 range. 75 is okay. 85 pushing a little bit higher. And again, you can adjust this with photo period lighting for if you're ideally trying to breed, if you're trying to maintain them, trying to keep it a little bit cooler so they don't burn as many calories. There's multiple different aspects and things you can do. But again, monitoring and keeping temperature is another very important thing. I've been using this one currently for my brumation, but it's another good digital thermostat and humidity gauge from ZoomEd. Right now it's hitting at 100.6 and 17% humidity as you see it just raised while I was talking I just threw it on the side of one of my basking areas but again you can extend these out stick these to the wall so you can watch them and have it right under the basking area or right by the side but generally let you know what the temperature is another good way to have for the basking area and also putting it in the cool end of the tank to know what your ambient temperatures are and it's key to monitor this because any subtle drop can slow down your lizard or anything too high can be harmful to where they're not basking during the day they're hiding and not getting the proper uvb light or even the temperatures to properly digest their food so again temperatures are very key for your maintaining your collared lizard properly now lighting is another key factor i'm going to show you guys several different lighting options I've experimented on quite a few, going through a lot of different things. One of the ones that I like and stick to is the Reptisun, again, 10.0 UVB. These are desert lizards that need a high spectrum UVB. So these strip lights are good to keep. As you can see on top here, behind the Fluker's Reptiboost, I have one of the large strip lights back here. This gives UVB lighting. And again, I do have a UVB reader, so knowing that over time the uvb strength will diminish that's why it's suggested between every six months to a year you change out your uvb bulbs or need be have a sensor to actually read where the proper uvb lighting is as you can see it comes down but the optimal t distance that i use is actually right on top there now, if it does fade a little bit, I can actually raise that, put more sand in, put other objects in if I want to do that. But generally, I have a stockpile of these. There's other ones that you can get too. This is, I think, a Lucky Hurt 10.0 UVB. But again, I have a reader, so I actually can assess how strong these are in the beginning to actually tell. There's another reptile one. I've tried with so many different ones. Here's actually a coiled one. These have a odd different spectrum they're actually really good for certain pinpoint ones but not as good for a broader wider range so i have played with these a little bit you can get these on chewy.com other things and then another good heat source is basically halogen light bulbs now this is one from zilla it's a mini one i have over here that you can actually see um blue light here i like white lights okay again a little light it emits decent heat but again, I like some of the larger, cheaper, more incandescent halogen bulbs that you can generally get at like Home Depot. This is another one, different halogen bulb you can find, um, ranging from like 50, 75, 100 watt. Again, judge with your digital thermometer or thermometer what the temperature output is. There's other blue lights you can get or reptile specific ones that have heat as well as UVB. So there's multiple factors. This is actually another Philips plant light bulb. It puts out a UVB range that isn't generally ideal for normal D3 formulation and metabolize, metabolizing in these lizards. But again, this actually outputs a lot of good heat and I've actually shown can help with some 
Nice colorations in your lizards, so another good option. Home Depot, Lowe's has these. Then there's other different heat light bulbs that you can get, generic ones that output a nice focused heat for a basking area. Again, there's so many different options. And what I like to say is just as long as it hits the proper heat and temperature that you need or UVB light, because again, you're gonna want a heat light, something that gives you UVB, as well as proper you know, shelter, hydration with water, and again, some substrate for enrichment, other climbing things. Then for another way for heat, you can actually use some ceramic bulbs. I have one little here with a different type of heat lamp. And again, you can use the plastic heat lamps here. And I actually like and more reliable and last longer. I have over here is more of the ceramic top ones. These generally just tend to be hardier again and gives good heat and then you have a coiled light and other different strip lighting here but again good lighting is very key changing it out between every six months to 12 months gives you the proper uvb spectrum that you need you can play with different brands i personally don't have one favorite i'm trying out multiple different ones and if you do have the extra money to buy a UVB reader, because they run in the $250, even some up to four or $500 range, I use these for in the clinics and other things like that, just have people bring the light bulbs in to actually read it, show them, hey, I bought this bulb, but now it actually has no UVB output is another key important thing. So again, natural sunlight is perfect. We try to mimic these, so again, using a UVB light, but then also using proper supplementation of vitamin D3. I generally use two to three times a week because I don't keep them outside here, being in the mountains in Virginia. Maybe during the summer I can get some if I keep them outside, but again, nothing is the same as an actual desert sunlight. So again, UVB dusting to compensate for anything they don't get with the UVB light. Um, Calcium D3, calcium, are very important for dusting. Another thing I like to use sometimes if they're not holding a lot of good weight is the Fluker's Reptiboost. This is more of an appetite stimulator, but they have a lot of good formulations and other things that are in here that are ideal, as well as giving hydration to your lizard. So mixing it with water, following the instructions, there's actually an instruction guide comes with a syringe, little medicine cup, other things like that. But you actually see the breakdown of different things they have, like crude protein, calcium, has a phosphorus in it, but again, a lower ratio than the calcium, which is needed. But then there's vitamin D, vitamin A, a vitamin E, a lot of other things that, in case your animal is low on it, this is a good, again, kind of catchy name, Repta Boost for your lizards. But it's another good thing to have on hand. I think Fluker's, um, sells it to PetSmart, but Chewy.com also has it pretty cheap. Uh, so again, a good thing to have on hand just to help out your lizards, and especially collared lizards. Six week old crickets, so as you see, it's just before they get the wings. So if you do get them in large orders, it's actually better because you don't have to hear all that annoying chirping all the time. But these guys, I do feed to my adults. And it's one of my main for sources of food. This, and along with the dubia roaches, but pretty much these guys have a decent amount of protein. And other things that the collared lizards need, I do dust these as recommended earlier, probably around two to three times a week, just because my guys don't get the natural sunlight UVB that they naturally would get in the wild. But again, these are crickets, six week old. I do also have four week old ones that I do offer to my younger ones. And you can also see some little smaller ones in here. So need be if you do get an order or get some larger ones and you do have some little ones to feed, you can always just hand pick out the smaller ones for the little ones if you're not afraid to touch them. Here are some baby Dubia roach nymphs that I have. I just grabbed these out of one of my Dubia colonies. Maybe later I'll show you guys actually how to build your own Dubia roach colony. But just to show you get these guys, these are actually pretty high in protein, higher than crickets per size and per ratio. So it's a pretty good main food source. This is one of the main food sources I do offer and I do breed my own. So it does make it very cost effective and efficient. 
So I just grab these little guys. The females tend to pop out a bunch of little babies all the time. As long as they're happy, you have the right food for them and other things. But again, dubia roaches are one of the main food sources. These guys are smaller. Generally, depending on size, I'll actually feed these to newborn and neonates. And then generally for my larger adults, I'll feed around three quarter of an inch size nymphs. I'd never feed my actual breeder adults because that's what keeps my colony alive. But these guys, I can have so many of them that I can afford to put a little bit of them in there. Hey guys, so this is another source of food that I like to feed my collared lizards here at Colorful Collar Lizard Ranch. These guys are super worms. Larger version of mealworms, pretty much, and I generally feed these more as a snack because they tend to get addicted to these and will actually refuse to take crickets or other feeders. So I tend to only feed these when I'm holding or once a week inside their tank. But these are a great source of protein and also can be a source of fluids, but never replace feeding with any source of water. You're going to need water in their tank regardless. I have heard some people say, oh, they get their water from their crickets and food. No, that's actually not good because as discussed earlier in this, to be able to metabolize the vitamin D3 with their kidney, they do need a source of water. So hydration is very key in that process as well. Now here are actually the mealworms. So these again are the, like a smaller version of superworms. And I tend to feed these more towards my smaller juvenile guys just to get them used to eating superworms. But it's also another good source of protein and a little bit of hydration. But again, I generally stick these to more snacks. This is what I use towards training time of holding them. I'll offer one of these guys and they love to gobble them down and they can take a few down as well. And it's just easier for them to swallow. Always rule of thumb, you don't try to force anything down that's wider than their eyes, but I've seen collar lizards take down some pretty big insects in their size. But again, just generally good to keep smaller ones. As you can see, the size difference is pretty extreme between the, the mealworms and superworms. You do get some larger mealworms, but generally you can have a range of different sizes. These are some here that I've bred. So you can see you got some little ones and bigger ones, but Again, another good food source for the younger juveniles, but I generally don't feed these to my larger collared lizards. For this part, I wanna show you guys just some collared lizards drinking normally out of a water dish where I generally pour the water in, they'll come running over knowing it's there to drink. And I'll also show you some other techniques for some that are more pickier, where you actually drop the water down onto rocks or actually spray up against the glass. As you can see shortly, I have a juvenile lightning yellow New Mexico male where he's actually licking the water off of different surfaces. This is how he prefers to drink. And another way, as I said earlier, is using the Fluker's Reptiboost. This is a juvenile aquaflame male who I just grabbed out of one of the tanks in a show, I generally try to open the mouth using the syringe very carefully not to really ag aggravate them or get them frustrated and just get some of the fluid in their mouths. As you can see, I squeeze in here and then I gently pull away and you can see as it focuses a little bit better, he actually starts to drink the Reptiboost that I put in his mouth. It's very important to maintain hydration in these guys because that helps with proper metabolizing of vitamin D3 and other things to have a happy, healthy collar lizard. Finally, I would like to end with some enclosures and setups. Here's just some examples of what I have here of a 275 gallon tank where I have a large tank of a lot of lizards. Here's a 75 gallon setup where I have an aqua flame, another 275 gallon where I divided it three ways for breeding, another tree where multiple collar lizards can hang out on, male and female hanging out in a basking area, and then just different setups and arrangements for the different variations of tanks, allowing for a lot of climbing space, hiding space, areas where they can just bask out and relax. And you can see this guy hiding in the back over here. It's pretty funny, but areas for comfort and relaxation while they hide and move around the tank.